Well, we're just so happy uh, to be together from all across this unbelievable nation of ours and, and to think that you love us truly, madly, deeply. And Father, I pray as we examine who you are and that we will uh, draw closer to you. Ultimately, we'll get to know you better. If we don't know you that well yet, then maybe Father, we'll really grasp a little bit more about who you are and even find out and delve into this and seek you out uh, because we know, Father, you have sought us out. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the example that he is and certainly that he was. Thank you for his death ultimately because it meant life for us. Yeah. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So let's yeah. share Let's share a little bit. Um, so what we have done, um, if you're joining us for the first time or you happen to have uh, joined us last Sunday, um, there are a, f- a few fellowship uh, churches that are in fellowship that got together and we celebrated Easter together. And um, I mean, there's no more uh, a great uh, personification of hope. That is when death has been destroyed and sin has been destroyed. And, and, and we came together, we thought, man, let's get together and let's talk a little bit and have three different uh, classes where people could start in their journey, find out a little bit about their relationship with God, uh, find out a little bit about our faith community. And then there are a couple of other classes that's going on simultaneously that is about um, the God, the Spirit, and also the book of Revelation. Sometimes there's a lot of questions on those kinds of things, but we are in deep fellowship with one another. And one of the things that I'll tell you a little bit about us, we uh, really believe in strong fellowship with one another. I remember I was, uh, I was sitting down with a guy, actually we were playing golf together and he asked me this question. He said, he said, Tony, what, what is different from your church than other churches? I said, well, I'm not really into necessarily comparing uh, churches, but I can tell you this. I know something that is a trademark. It is a hallmark. It is very much part of our congregation is our fellowship with one another. And, uh, and, and I know for a long time, I went to a church where, where uh, it was a Sunday thing and then I was gone. And then if I came back next Sunday, great. If I didn't come back next Sunday, I didn't see those people until I came back again. One of the things that we are all about is really trying to get involved in, that, in each other's lives. Of course, the pandemic has thrown a monkey's wrench into that, but we've really tried to circumvent that in many ways by having Zoom meetings and certainly having sometimes going one another, COVID friendly, of course, uh, each other's place and so on and so forth. So, so today what we're gonna do, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, our, who our great God is. And, 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 and obviously uh, this is by no means an exhaustive study, but the idea is we are gonna expose uh, our God to, to you and to me and be inspired and encouraged a little bit about that. And so to get us going, uh, I'm going to ask Melanie to sh- go ahead and share and have her share a little bit why she started, where she started when she began in her relationship with God. What is it about God that inspired her? What is it about this quality of God? And maybe, it, and the idea is not necessarily that you will have the same journey, but the idea it will stir in you, hey, where am I at? And how, what do I want to grasp about this God? So she'll go ahead and share right now. Awesome, it's good to see everybody. Um, So I think I'll start with just sharing that I um, grew up with an understanding of God. So um, I grew up in a Christian-based household, and my perception of God um, was a God who was very punitive. And so um, the idea of God being loving or having a close connection with him that was not something that I understood. And so, you know, as I got into my teen years, I started asking questions that I felt like questions about life, questions about purpose and things like that. And I, I felt like I just was not able to receive the answers that made sense to me. And so, 
you know, I started a journey of just looking at the scriptures myself and quickly found out that the Bible is a little bit confusing if you just start to read it from the beginning, um, because it's not written like, you know, like a book, it's chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, it's, it's kind of composed in different ways. And so um, I found it difficult to follow um, and more importantly, difficult to understand what, how it applied to me. And so it wasn't until I actually, um, my sister-in-law was one of the people who introduced me to um, studying the scriptures that I actually started to learn a little bit more about God. And um, I studied, I had a Bible study on the cross and it was specifically what Jesus did on the cross and why he did it. And I always, I think I always kind of looked at that whole thing like, okay, well, he died on the cross. Okay, great. You know, that's, I guess, what he was supposed to do. It didn't mean anything to me. And so for the first time, opening up the scriptures and realizing that this, that this thing that God did, he did for me, really hit me. And I was like, I wanted to know more and I wanted to understand why why the, the extra, extravagance of this gift. I mean, it just, it, it seemed incredibly extravagant of God to do what he did. And so it, it began this journey of trying to understand who this God was. Um, and, you know, I, I don't have time to kind of share the entire journey, but I want to share two scriptures that for me painted the picture and broadened my understanding of of who God is. And one of them is found in Zephaniah 317. And the Bible says this, it says, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves you. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. And then the other scripture is in Isaiah 43 verses one to three. And it says, but now this is what the Lord says, he who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze for I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your savior. And one of the reasons these scriptures really moved me, I think, is because it, it showed a intimacy in the way that God feels about us that I didn't understand. Mm. And I certainly didn't experience. You know, I came to reading the scriptures from a very confused and very insecure place. There were a lot of things going on in my life that, um, that I feel like actually just broke me as a person. And, um, and I think I was suffering on the inside, but on the outside presenting a picture that everything was okay. And so I didn't, I don't even think I realized until I got into the scriptures that this was a need for me, that, that I needed this kind of intimacy with my God, that I didn't just want to worship on a Sunday morning and say the prayers that I needed to say, but I really wanted, I needed intimacy. And I needed to understand that this God knew me and knew my situation and cared about what I was going through. And so when the scripture says things like, he will take delight in you, I was like, what does that even mean? Like, what do you mean me? Yeah, of course, God loves the whole world but he delights in me. He's going to, he's going to rejoice over me. And I think when I put these scriptures together with the extravagance of the cross and what Jesus did on the cross, it started to make sense that this God wasn't just this omnipotent being who, you know, kept himself separate and above the world and kind of checked in with the world when it needed his help, but that this being was engaged with us. And so it then that led me to even some greater pursuits of looking at 
you know, because I think there is such a problem of suffering in the world and our difficulty with a great and powerful God and why he allows all these things to happen. And so it, it led me to even some deeper things that I learned about God and fairness and justice and righteousness and those things that mean a lot to me and I think mean a lot to all of us. Um, and so over the years, I think that's that awareness has just developed and grown. And I know that I have so much further to go in my understanding of all those things, but I feel like it isn't a journey that I'm on by myself and this God is up there distant. I feel like I'm on this journey with God and that he has met me where I was, where I, in that moment, in that weakness and that insecurity, God met me in that place and taught me about him. And so, yeah, without giving you the history of my whole life, um, that really meant a lot to me that God would do that um, and love me in such a unique way and a special way and an intimate way, I think. So. And when does this, when does this searching begin, like at this level, at this intensity, so to speak about um, when you, when you realize this is the God that the scripture talks about? You mean after I sort of came to, yeah, I think, you know, very early on in my journey with God, what I realized about myself in my insecurity was that I had a very, very narrow view of God, right? And so because I had such a narrow view of God, it affected not only my relationship with God, but it affected my relationship with other people. And through discussions with people and, you know, people who'd read the Bible for many years and asking questions, you know, I came to this realization that I, I need to pursue this if I really want to, to know the answers. No, I, I can just have a peripheral understanding and go on my journey. But if I really want to know these answers, I've got to pursue this and I have to pursue it with like I would pursue anything else that I wanted to really know the answers to. And so very, I think probably I was a couple years into my journey with God when I started really looking at what does the Bible actually say? And what do I actually think about what the Bible says? And then the questions that I didn't have answers to that I was, was I willing to pray and be patient and talk to other people and converse until I got to a place where I was content um, and at peace? Because I think the subject of God is a never ending subject. But at some point, I think as you're journeying with God, you have to you have to be patient with that process, right? You're not going to learn it all in one sitting. Um, and then I think even as I mature as an individual, that that maturity with God grows and the understanding grows. And so, but yeah, I think it was just that commitment to really seeking out what does the Bible say? Not what does my minister say? Or what does that person say? <laughs> you know, what did I know growing up? But what does the Bible actually say? Um, so. Well, oh, fantastic. You know, one of the things that I wanted to uh, really inspire and encourage you that God is not a destination. Yeah. He's a journey. Uh, uh, you know, uh, meaning it's not you get to a certain point. I found out all I need to know about God. You know, I've been married now to my wife for 29 years, and it is and it is a continual uh, journey that we are discovering more about each other. That it's absolutely fantastic. God is not to be discovered per se. God is to be pursued. And, 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 and honestly, the more we pursue, and obviously we understand he pursues us, it is a beautiful relationship. And that's something that uh, we're going to talk a little bit about here today. Where I'm going to come from today is in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 17, this is an, uh, an encounter where uh, a guy by the name of Paul, who was a recent convert, so to speak, he was a persecutor of people who were following Jesus. He now real, had an encounter with Jesus, not unlike some of us have had, and said, now that I know who this Jesus is, I am on his side, and I want to share a little bit about him. And so we pick it up in uh, Acts chapter. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry about it. Just listen to what it says. Uh, you can write down the scripture reference if you'd like and, 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 um, and, and, and follow up with that. It says in Acts chapter 17, while Paul was waiting for them, them was two of his friends named Timothy and Silas. 
He was waiting there in Athens. He was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as those in the marketplace. Ty looks like he was talking about you there, about the marketplace, <laughs> uh, uh, day by day uh, with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And if you, unless you've been under a rock the last little bit, uh, the resurrection theme and uh, has been all around uh, uh, anywhere you go in the recent past. And that's what exactly what Paul was talking about. The, and that was a strange kind of thing that Jesus died and he was raised again physically, not just uh, uh, um, uh, spiritually, but he was raised physically. Mm -hmm. Then they took him and brought him to a place, uh, a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what is this new teaching that you're presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. I mean, I love these guys. They were curious. They heard something. They didn't just take it for granted. We say, that's a strange thing, but I'm curious enough to know at least to find out what in the name of tarnation are you talking about? All the Athenians and the foreigners who live there spent their time doing nothing but talking about listening to the latest ideas. And we thought that TMZ and Entertainment Tonight was a new thing. It, it, was, always, <laughs> it was always going on. Paul stood up at the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you were very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you were ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. And Paul looked around and he says, guys, obviously you guys are spiritual people. You, you have a lot of idols. You're thinking about God. You even have a thing that says, I know there's a God. I don't quite know him, but I know there's one. And he says, okay, let me put some things into perspective for you. In verse 24, he says, the God who made this world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temple built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. And Paul uses this opportunity, by the way, these, as we know, the, the, the Greeks uh, uh, were very philosophical people and certainly were, were well educated. And that's one of the things I love about what Paul did here is that, you know, when you become a follower of Christ, or if you're even curious about God, you don't have to check your brains or your education or your intellect at the door. Mm -hmm. Paul says, okay, let's figure out where we're at and let's see what this God, about and what God is all about. And, and, and here's what it says, something quite remarkable. I mean, this might, this might really throw you for a, a little bit of a loop. He says this, God has determined the times and places where we should be where we are for the express purpose of finding him after seeking him out. You know, it is my conviction that, uh, you know, whenever we have spiritual encounters, God is continually building some things in our lives so that we can reach out and find out who exactly he is. You know, and, and here's the thing. God, Paul, Paul is writing, he's saying, you know, sometimes while God may seem that far from us, he is not that far from us. Seeking him, that God is pursuing a relationship with each and every one of us. And I don't know if you've ever seen that, but I remember about 30 years ago now, I was pursuing a relationship with this lovely lady. And, 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 and I did, 
I, I bought her things to get her to like me. I wrote her cards. I took her out on dates to see whether or not she was going to pay any attention to me. Um, and I pursued her. Uh, sometimes I, I, I would go to a place where she would, I know where she would be and, and, and sort of like pretending it was by accident. Oh, you, oh, you happen to be here too. Isn't that crazy? Um, you know, I, a stalker. I it's a stalker. Kidding. But the, I, the idea of seeking God and God seeking us is that God is always trying to get our attention. Yeah. And I don't know if you may realize this, but God has been seeking your attention and putting you into situations that you would seek him and find him. I got to tell you, I, I've, been, I've been pursuing this God, so to speak, for about 35 years, right? And, and something happened just recently that only continues to enhance that. So make a long story short, my daughter and my grandson was coming back from Spain, and there were some massive complications, I have never prayed that hard in my life. More importantly, I didn't know what was happening. And when things are out of your hands and you realize you can do nothing about it except trust in God, it's a very vulnerable place to be. It's a very humbling place to be. And I don't know if that's where you are in your journey, that there is a, your back is to the wall, you're at your wit end, wit's end in regard to certain things in your life or discovering. And I don't think that those situations that we have been put in is by accident. It's actually continual. And, and, and it's a very interesting dynamic is that it forced me to express a faith and a trust that I have never had that level before, right? You know, you've got your eight-year-old grandson traversing the world, not knowing what's happening exactly and uh, complicated by the COVID-19. So I don't know, and that's a minor thing relative to where some of you may be at. Maybe, maybe there's a marriage situation that you, you don't know how to figure out. Maybe there's a parenting situation. Maybe, maybe there's, a, there's a health situation. Maybe you're your wits end um, with this COVID and now that we're in another lockdown. But here's, here's what I want to open up your mind to. Do not think that God is not trying to put boundaries and times in place so that you can seek him. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that's why the pandemic was caused, but that could be one of the consequences, dare I even say benefits of the pandemic, that it actually forces us to be in a particular situation. And that's what Paul is writing. He says, listen, do you understand that that's who God is? That he's not this God that is out there that is uninvolved, that he's very involved in orchestrating putting times and places in your life. And I don't know how that resonates with you, but God is a God that is truly, madly, deeply in love with you. So much so, while he will not badger you per se, he will continually pursue you to communicate to you, I love you immensely. Now, I put that together with Ephesians chapter 2 that shows us another quality of God. And, and the idea here, like I said from the very start, that my encouragement is for you to, oh, is this who God is? Really? Like Melanie said uh, about 30 years ago, she, she discovered a God, so to speak, that was not the one that she was familiar with. It was a different, quote unquote, a God that was unknown to her, so to speak, as Paul was addressing. And, and she said, if this is the God that is truly out there, I want to know this God. 
I want to find out about this God. <clears throat> that is God truly orchestrating things and times in my life so that I can seek him and find him? Mm. Truly? Is he that involved in my life? Mm. That he's not just this, this figure up there and watching us struggle, but he's actually involved in an intimate level so that we can find him. Well, in, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4, we see another attribute. And when we put these things together, man, this God is worth pursuing. Like when I started dating Melanie and I said, man, she's the one. I said, this girl is worth pursuing. I mean, whatever it costs, we're doing this, all right? And, 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 and what I want you to help understand is that when you understand that's who God is, there are times that the scripture describes God and a relationship with him that a guy sold all he had to bought that field and that field was representative of a relationship with God. There's one guy who was very wealthy and, 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 and he was willing to pay the entire price obviously poetic language to help us understand when we catch a glimpse of who this God is, it absolutely opens open up something in our lives to say, I want to know that God. Verse 4, chapter 2. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated up with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressing his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from ourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I love, I love the poetic language here. It says, God who is rich in mercy. Another time the Bible describes God as having mercies that never end. I don't know if you've got siblings or a spouse or kids there's sometimes that your mercy runs out, right? <laughs> and, 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 but and so the concept of God never having a limit to his mercy, that he's so rich in mercy that it never runs out is a crazy thought. This idea of grace, and that, that might be some Bible words that you're not familiar with. The idea of grace is that you get a favor that you haven't earned. Right. And, and, and so God is this God who is giving us something that in one case that we don't deserve. Mercy is the flip side. I'll just really quickly explain it is not getting something that you deserve. That is punishment. In this mm -hmm. case, if you were to read earlier, he says we were by nature's wrath, objects of wrath because we have disobeyed God. But God, because he says, I don't want to give you what you deserve. I want to give you mercy. I have limitless mercy, not only mercy, but grace, not giving you what you don't deserve. In this case, blessings, even though you don't deserve it. And so this idea is God is merciful and gracious. And get this, this was expressed to us in Christ Jesus. Meaning when we understand who Jesus is, we will understand his grace and his mercy even more. So not only did this idea of God open up my eyes and my ears and my heart to know God the Father, it helped me to understand if this is found in Christ, I want to know who Jesus is too. Mm -hmm. If that is where it is expressed, that's what he says, right? His incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So here's, here's, here's some crazy, here's some crazy thought. God's mercy and grace is expressed to us in the form of Christ Jesus. Mm. What? 
And then when we just celebrated the death, burial, and resurrection, and you understand that all in picture, it says, ah, now I get why this is phrased the way it is, that in Christ Jesus, God's mercy that is limitless, God's grace that is abundant, is expressed through Christ Jesus to get to know Christ and what he has done for us and who he is. Not what some guy who wears a suit and a nice hat and says about this Jesus, okay? But that you really, really, really understand how incredibly gracious, kind that this Jesus is. And so hopefully what we have done for you for in a few minutes is to at least awaken in you. Okay, I'm, I'm not even sure I believe that that's the God. And I say, start somewhere. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul did with these guys. He says, start somewhere. Start pursuing. And if it's true that God is this intimately involved in my life, as he did, as he expressed to the, the, to the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers at the Areopagus, he says, if this is true, let me try it out. Let me figure it out. Let me see if this is what it really, really is. And, and I, I can tell you this, this journey is, and this God that is so incredibly gracious, that God has been working through all mankind to reconcile uh, himself to us. And now you might say, well, why this whole big kit and caboodle, so to speak? Why the death on the cross and all this kind of stuff? And, and, and that's why I, I, I really, really would ask you to investigate this, the, some qualities of God that is incredible. That is, one of it is, is his holiness, right? Mm -hmm. And that God is so holy that he can't dwell with sin. And the moment that he's able to do that, he ceases to be God. And, 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 and so, and we can talk a little bit more about that another time. We can, we can examine these kinds of things. One of the things that we try to do is not only talk about things from, from, a, from a, a public vantage point. One of the things that was incredibly important to me and that was incredibly helpful to me is I was able to sit with people individually and walk and talk about my relationship with God. And it really helped me in my journey uh, in terms of pursuing God. And I can tell you this, I got serious about this about 35 years ago. In November, it'll be 35 years. And I can tell you, I am more excited about my relationship and finding out and continually pursuing God today. It hasn't gotten boring. It hasn't gotten less exciting. It is actually more exciting today than it was even back then. Why? Because this God is so deep. He's yeah. so mysterious. He is so full of mercy and grace. And the more I understand this Jesus, the more I understand that phrase. That is some deep things, by the way. I don't, we don't, I, I don't want to get that, uh, that, that deep. But that idea of what is just expressed there is phenomenal. Yeah. Hope I whet your appetite. Hope I've at least got your mind thinking. Is this this God? I had a picture of who this God is. What I wanted to do is to repaint and reshuffle that picture. Have you ever seen those paintings when someone is doing a painting and you thought it was something? And then with a few brushes a little later, that's not what I thought it was. It's, the, it's a completely different picture. That's what I wanted to do. If your, your picture was a little out of focus, I wanted to take some paintbrush and have some strokes and at least clarify it a little bit to be able to say, this is what it looks like. It started to come into focus. I don't quite see it all yet. It still is remarkable. You know, this woman besides me that I've known for 30 years, I, I am still excitingly trying to figure out uh, our relationship. That doesn't make it less exciting. It makes it 
more exciting. Our God is infinitely more incredible. I mean, she's awesome, but you know, I don't think she's going to argue that God is more, uh, more awesome than she is. And and uh, but but that's the idea of what 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 this is all about. So, you know, I, I trust that I trust that your appetite has been wet. Melanie's going to share, uh, read one more thing, and then get any questions, comments. You think I've lost my mind completely? Uh, let me know, <laughs> and and uh, we shall go from there. Why don't you go ahead and read, babe? Yeah, you know, I think when we um, engage with scripture or this idea of God, you know, I think it is, as Tony was talking about, it is really important to, to envision. Mom? <laughs> <laughs> it's really important to kind of envision um, this as a relationship, because I know one of the things, even for myself, that that the world teaches us is is to divorce ourselves from our hearts, right? And we don't, we're not really taught from a young age to, to live expressly from our heart. And um, this writer in this book um, called The Sacred Romance really captures what I'm trying to say, um, because in order to really get to know God, you have to be willing to be courageous and live from a place in your heart and not just, you know, the outside. And so this is what he says. He says this, starting very early, life has taught all of us to ignore and distrust the deepest yearnings of our heart. Life for the most part teaches us to suppress our longing and live out in the external world where efficiency and performance are everything. We have learned from parents and peers at school, at work, and even from our spiritual mentors that something else is wanted from us other than our heart, which is to say that which is most deeply us. Very seldom are we ever invited to live out of our heart. If we are wanted, we are often wanted for what we can offer functionally. If rich, we are honored for our wealth. If beautiful, for our looks. If intelligent, for our brains. So we learn to offer only those parts of us that are approved living out a carefully crafted performance to gain acceptance from those who represent life to us. We divorce ourselves from our heart and begin to live a double life. And so he, he the, you know, this book really describes how God will not ever settle for that. And if, if you pursue a relationship with God, then he's not going to be okay with just you putting in the outward. He's going to pursue you until he reaches your heart, until he teaches you how to live out of your heart and live an authentic life with him. And, and I love that about God, but what I, what I also love about it is God taught me through my relationship with him how to be courageous, how to live that way, regardless of how anyone else sort of looked at me, right? It's, oh, the title of the book is called The Sacred Romance. And it's really this call um, that God has. It's, it's, it's literally describing what Tony was talking about, where God pursues you and he will not stop or settle for just the outward performance. He really wants your heart and he's going to pursue you until he captures your heart and, to, and, and he teaches you as well how to live from that place. And that takes courage, you know? It, it's, it's a cour courageous thing to live that kind of authentic life um, because sometimes you're gonna be judged for it or sometimes you're gonna be misunderstood, um, but to keep living that sort of authentic, courageous life, it's, it's but I, th I actually think it's what the world needs. <laughs> The world doesn't need the perfection of the outside. I think the world needs, it needs this, it needs the heart. It needs us authentically loving each other and teaching, you know, God from a non-religious authentic place. So, yeah, and so, so next week, what we're going to look at, uh, same time, same bad channel, um, <laughs> we are going to talk, flesh out this kindness expressed to us this mercy and grace in Christ Jesus right so we're going to we're going to flesh that out a little bit and you're going to see why it was phrased the way that the mercy and grace was ultimately expressed in Christ Jesus and we're going to systematically go through that a little bit next week and and whet your appetite again 
ultimately, uh, full disclosure, so that you can pursue this God with all that you are and all that you have. And because it's worth it. Yeah. It's totally, totally worth it. So thoughts, comments, questions. Yeah.